Okay, we are running a little bit tight on time, so I think I, I'm going to ask those of you who have questions. We do have a break later on, and you'll have a chance to, uh, to catch uh, Professor Zellin during the break and can speak to him then. Uh, in, it looks like everyone has seats. There are, again, some seats up in front, but this is good. Okay, everyone is seated today. Uh, I, do, I do want to mention, when I mentioned the organizations uh, sponsoring the, the meeting today, uh, I neglected to mention also the Israel Statistical Association, We're holding this event in cooperation with them. Those of you who aren't members, think about joining. There are some uh, forums outside which you can use to, uh, to join the organization. Okay. With that, I want to move on to our, our next talk. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Renat Sakov. Uh, Dr. Sakov is, has a, uh, her degree in, in statistics from the University of California at Berkeley, and she's now the head of the statistics unit at uh, Teva Pharmaceuticals in Israel. Thank you, David, for uh, inviting me, and uh, good afternoon. So I want to talk about statistical challenges in the development of biosimilar drugs. And um, I will start with some introduction to um, some of the concepts in clinical trials. I assume that not everyone is familiar with those concepts. Um, I will then talk about um, the fixed margin method and the synthesis method. I will do some comparison between them, and if I will have time left, I will talk about uh, choice, choice of metrics to uh, measure the um, effect size. So I will start with the introduction, and I want to start with some differences. So the first distinction I want to make is between chemical and biological drugs. Uh, so chemical drugs are drugs which are uh, chemically synthesized, and they are known as uh, small molecules, whereas biological drugs are based on uh, proteins or other types of uh, living cells. Um, we use biotechnology to manufacture them, and they are known as uh, large molecules, and typically they are more expensive uh, drugs because of their uh, manufacturing process. Um, next in the introduction, which is somewhat different um, issue, I want to discuss the um, clinical development uh, process or stages um, of a branded product. So the purpose of clinical trials is to demonstrate the safety and efficacy of a new drug. And uh, we can divide the development uh, process into several stages or phases. So the first one is phase one, which is um, typically consists of several uh, small studies, uh, not always, but often in uh, healthy volunteers. Uh, the focus is on safety. We can start and look for uh, the right dose. And um, we evaluate what's called the pharmacokinetic properties, where the pharmacokinetics are, is what the body does to the drug, and it is measured by different, um, uh, by the concentration of the drug in the, um, in the blood. Uh, next are the phase two study, which are larger size studies. They are still not very large. Uh, they are shorter duration than the phase three. Um, we look at safety. We can look at, uh, still look for uh, the right Oops, uh, the right dose. Um, we will look for signal for efficacy, and they can use uh, surrogate major measures or biomarkers, um, and not the endpoint that will be used in the, confirmato stu the confirmatory studies, which are the phase three studies. Um, the phase three studies are the large size studies, they have longer duration, and uh, the objectives are both safety and efficacy. If those studies are successful, then uh, the drug hopefully will be approved. Um, there are several types of comparisons, and the first one is superiority trials. Um, the second is non-inferiority, and the third is equivalence. In superiority, we usually uh, compare the test to a placebo, although it might be that we will compare the test drug to some kind of uh, standard of care. Um, and here, if I denote by TNP the effect of the test drug and the placebo, we would like to see that the test is better 
the, the test drug is better than the placebo. And uh, this is demonstrated, for example, by showing that the lower bound of a 95% confidence interval is positive. And if this is demonstrated, then we say that T is superior to the placebo or to the standard of care. In non-inferiority trials, uh, it might be the case that it's not ethical to compare the test drug to placebo, and then the test drug is being compared to an active control. Uh, I will denote it here by C. And in non-inferiority trials, actually, uh, from the statistical point of view, it looks very similar to superiority, the, the way that the hypotheses are written. Uh, but what the purpose, I mean, the, the objective here is to, to show the T is not worse than um, uh, C than in some amount which is called the margin or the non-inferiority margin. And the justification to this margin should be um, clinical. And uh, non-inferiority is established if the lower bound of a 95 confidence interval for this difference between the two drugs is larger than this margin. And in equivalence trial, the treatment is compared to an active control. And there what we want to show is that the difference between the two is within some kind of uh, margin. So we basically want to show that the difference is within this margin. And this is done by um, demonstrating that uh, the 95% confidence interval is completely embedded in this margin. And graphically, in a superiority, if this is the zero, so uh, in this case, uh, the lower band is smaller than zero, so we do not demonstrate superiority. And in the second, in the second case, superiority is demonstrated. Similarly, in non-inferiority, um, here and here, uh, sorry, here, um, the lower bound is below the margin, so uh, non-inferiority is not established. Well, in those two situations, the non-inferiority is established. And in the last case, uh, in all of, in the first um, top three situation, the confidence interval is not fully embedded in the margin, so equivalence is not uh, demonstrated. Only in the last situation, equivalence is demonstrated. And for the same margin, alpha level and power, an equivalence trial will typically be a uh, larger size than a no inferiority trial, and this is important for them uh, for later. Um, Another topic is generic drugs. A generic drug is a legal copy of a branded drug. It's manufactured and distributed by another company after the expiration of uh, the patent. And uh, the regulatory requirement uh, for approval of a generic drug is that the generic and the branded pro product should be bioequivalent. Um, bioequivalence means that uh, it's demonstrated that uh, in, in a series of uh, phase one studies, which compared the PK properties of the generic and the branded, branded uh, products, and the shoe should be, should be um, um, identical or within some acceptable margin from each other. And there are very clear guide, uh, guidelines about what those margins should be. Uh, the rationale for this is that if the two are biologically equivalent, then they are expected to have the same ef effect. Uh, this is a faster... Um, process uh, to, I mean, this is much faster to do several phase one than to have the whole sequence of phase one, two, and three studies resulting in, uh, in cheaper drugs. What I described is the usual process to develop generics for chemical drugs, but not for biologics. Uh, the problem with the biological drugs is that they are more heterogeneous, and then it is understood that it's impossible to get an identical copy uh, in contrast to uh, chemical drugs. Uh, so there is a need for a development, uh, clinical development program which is more similar to the branded product. In particular, uh, we need a phase three study to demonstrate uh, efficacy. And because they, are not, they cannot be identical, we do not use the jargon of generic for uh, biological, but it's known as biosimilar or biogenerics or follow-on. This whole area is still uh, developing. And um, if a biosimilar will be approved, then again, it should, re it should um, result in reduced um, uh, healthcare costs. Um, regarding the regula regulations for biosimilar drugs, so the regulatory pathway here is less clear than for um, 
uh, regular generic. Uh, in Europe, there are several guidelines for biosimilar development. Nevertheless, uh, statistical aspects are still lacking. In the U.S., there is a legal pathway to approve biosimilar drugs, uh, but there are still no guidelines re regarding the scientific requirements. Uh, so, um, you know, what I'm going to talk uh, or to present are some of the challenges because it's still not clear what will be accepted. Um, there are statist statistical related uh, issues. Um, regarding the non-clinical aspects of the development, the pharmacokinetic comparability, and the efficacy, I will uh, focus on the efficacy part. Um, so the thing, the first question which we ask and on which there is some kind of debate is um, we demonstrated comparability in the non-clinical phases and we demonstrated bioequivalence or the comparability in the PK uh, properties. And then the question, should a phase three efficacy, um, efficacy study be a non-inferiority or equivalence? Um, on one hand, how likely it is that the new product is indeed better if the previous stages demonstrated uh, comparability? So this is one question. Another question is, let's say it is better. Do we mind if it's more efficacious, assuming that safety is unchanged? Now, why do we care? We care because if it's non-inferiority, the sample size is smaller than the sample size needed for um, equivalence, and since the purpose is to try and reduce the cost, if we are going to um, develop and we are required to use equivalence, it might be too costly even to start the development process. Um, and this brings me to the, to the issue of the choice of margin. For both non-inferiority and equivalence, we need to choose the margin. Uh, so I will describe um, um, some of the challenges here, and uh, much of this is uh, from um, the FDA guidance on non-inferiority, so it's not guidance which are specific for biosimilar, but in general for non-inferiority. So assume that uh, the effect of the, ac the active control over placebo, placebo is known, and it is 50%. So it's clear that the margin that we choose can be at most 50% because if we choose, for example, a margin of 60%, it might be that the product is worse than placebo. Uh, and let's denote by M1 the effect size, and I will, get, I will discuss this uh, choice of M1 uh, later. Uh, so if, one, if M1 is the effect size, we would like to choose some margin which is smaller from M1, um, and the question is how much of the effect we are willing uh, to lose. Uh, and actually, this smaller margin will be denoted by M M2. And the role of thumb is that M2 is half of uh, M1. Now, the, jo the, the choice of M1 and M2 is actually uh, a joint effort between the statistician and the clinician, taking into account different factors and they'll give you uh, some of the factors that we consider as examples. So for example, we want we to choose M1, and there are several historical studies, and the observed effects in each of them uh, was, they might be similar or different, but they are not the same. So which effect are we going to choose? Are we going to, use this, to take the smallest one? Are we going to do some kind of uh, meta-analysis in order to uh, get the margin? Um, and remember that we don't want to have margins which are too small because this affects our sample sizes. Uh, other considerations are, are the populations in the different studies similar to each other? Are they similar to the um, uh, population that we are planning to use in our study? Um, are there any changes to the standard of care since those studies were published? Because if the active control uh, was performed, I don't know, like 15 years ago. Standard of care is changing, so it might be that the effect that was uh, reported there is not relevant anymore. Um, and I want to go back to the first question, which is how do we combine the effects from the different uh, studies? So here, for example, we have four historical studies of placebo versus active control, and uh, say that we compare the percent of cured subjects, so the higher the proportion, the better. And we have here um, the proportion in each of the groups, and the, difference, uh, the differences are ranging between 26 to 38 
uh, percent, and we have here the 95 percent confidence interval. So how should we combine the four studies into a single estimate of a treatment effect? Uh, the approach, which is probably the most uh, commonly used, the, is the approach proposed by uh, Der Simonian and Lard uh, in a paper from 86. And they proposed <coughs> to do a meta-analysis via a random effect model, where basically uh, what their uh, approach is, is to assume that the effect in each study uh, is actually a, re a realization from a distribution of treatment effects. And then in the first stage, we are going to estimate the variability of this distribution. In the second stage, we are going to look at uh, weighted average of the estimates from each of the study, where the weights are a uh, function of the sample size of the individual studies and the, um, and the variability of this distribution, which was estimated in the first, in, in the first stage. And it is, it is then possible to construct confidence interval for this um, estimate. Um, the fixed margin approach um, is probably the most straightforward method to, um, uh, to do a non-inferiority or to do the analysis in a non-inferiority. And it is known also as the 95%, 95% method. And the idea behind this method is the following. Uh, the first, and this is actually done, the first part, the part here is actually in the design part. Um, so we are going to use historical data and to construct a 95% confidence interval for the effect of the active control. And we, and we take the lower bound of this confidence interval, and this is uh, called the M1, the effect size. Uh, in case of multiple studies, we will use here the meta-analysis, as, as I just described, but it might be that there is only a single historical study. Um, one, once we took this uh, lower bound, uh, we are taking M2, um, which is the margin to be used, uh, and this is a predef uh, predefined fraction of M1. And as I said, uh, typically um, the choice is uh, of half. And uh, then we continue with the design based on those margins. You can already see why this method is very conservative, because we are uh, taking the lower bound of, an, of uh, the confidence interval of the effect, and then we are taking half or some other um, uh, fraction of this. Uh, so this is the reason for the first 95. After the study is over, uh, we are going to construct a confidence interval for the effect of the test drug compared to the active control. And now we are looking at the lower, uh, at the lower bound of this 95% confidence interval and compare it to the margin. Um, and then whether the non-inferiority is established or not, depending on whether this lower bound is smaller or larger uh, than M2. Uh, now, the reason that this approach is called fixed margin is that um, once we are doing the meta-analysis, uh, the effect of the past studies is summarized and then it it is being treated as a fixed number. Um, as I said, the result of using this approach, uh, which is very conservative, um, means either very large sample sizes or if we cannot, uh, or if we have, um, for logistical reason, uh, we have a limit on the sample size, um, it hit in the power. Uh, the advantage of the fixed approach is that uh, the margin is pretty easy uh, for interpretation for clinicians, and clinicians <coughs> like um, this kind of approach because it's easier to understand. <coughs> Going back to the example uh, before, it's the same table, but if here uh, we are doing a meta-analysis on those results, uh, the estimate is 30%, the confidence interval is 25 to 35%, and then uh, M1 is 25%, M2 is 12.5%, and now um, a non-inferiority study will succeed if the lower confidence interval of the difference will be larger than uh, minus 12.5%. Um, in equations, I'm not used to equations anymore. Um, if I want to use um, to, you know, to uh, present the concept in equations, if we have um, mu t, t, mu c, and mu p as the um, 
um, effects of the test, active control and placebo res respectively, then the null hypothesis is that the difference between the treatment and the um, active control uh, is smaller than this margin and we want to reject this um, null hypothesis and to demonstrate that it's actually larger where to remind you M1 is based on the historical and this is the lower confidence interval comparing um, comparing the active uh, control with the placebo um, and basically here uh, M1 and M2 are treated as fixed and it's straightforward to get that uh, the test statistics gets this form uh, that we reject, you know, that we are looking, uh, it's really like half a line of algebra. We are looking at, um, at the effect between the treatment and the active control plus half uh, the historical divided by the standard deviation uh, of treatment, of the treatment versus the active control plus half the standard deviation between the active control and placebo. And this Z statistics needs to be larger than 1.96. And we will get back to this later. Um, I would like, uh, for the comparison that I'm going to do later, I want to consider here um, uh, a slightly easier set of uh, fixed margin approach in which instead of uh, using the M2 margin, which is more uh, conservative, uh, we would like to compare it to the M1 margin. And if uh, we are using here the M1 margin instead of the M2, then the form of the Z statistics is this, and I will get back to this later, and I call it easy because it's the easier form of the fixed method. Um, with this, I want to move to the synthesis method. Uh, where the synthesis method actually compare between the test drug and the placebo indirectly by synthesizing the outcomes from the non-inferiority and from the historical trials. And it takes into account the variability in both studies. Uh, it also allowed uh, for the estimation of uh, what's known as present effect preserved, and I will uh, present it in uh, a minute. And uh, the ideas that I and, and those ideas are based on uh, the papers of um, Hasselblatt and Kong and uh, Snapping and Jiang. Uh, in the synthesis method, if we are looking at the difference between the test drug and the placebo, in the, hypothesis, the, the, the null hypothesis is that uh, theta is smaller than zero versus, versus the... Um, the alternative that it's uh, larger than zero. So basically we want to show here superiority. And the estimate of this theta is actually, and this is actually the synthesis, is the effect from the non-inferiority plus the effect from the meta-analysis. And um, with this in mind, it's pretty direct to get that uh, the Z statistic uh, for using the synthesis get, gets this form, and I'll get to this form again in a second, uh, but before I want to um, define the fraction of effect preserved, fraction of, of the effect preserved is actually the ratio between the effect between the treatment and the placebo um, divided by the effect of the active control to the placebo, and this can be written in this form, and then uh, it can be estimated using the non using this equation where the numerator is actually based on the non-inferiority trial and the denominator is actually the effect that we um, uh, estimated based on the historical data. Now, I want to demonstrate those ideas in this example. So let's say that we have a historical study. Uh, we have two arms and both of size 1,000. And in the placebo group, we had 100 events, and in the active control, we had 130. So this is uh, the difference uh, in proportions, and we get this confidence interval. So actually what we see here is that the active control is indeed superior to the placebo because the lower bound is positive. Uh, the M M1 margin would be this uh, lower bound, and M2 is half of this, so the, the non-inferiority will be uh, established uh, if uh, the difference is larger than minus M2, which is 0 0.001. Now, in the non-inferiority studies, those are the results that we got. We had the two uh, arms, 
uh, both of size 2000, um, and this is the difference, and this is the 95% confidence interval. So there are several points here. First, um, in terms of uh, uh, rate, the test drug is even better than the active control. Nevertheless, when we are looking at the lower bound of the, um, of the confidence interval, uh, it is smaller from this margin, and then non-inferiority is not demonstrated. Uh, alternatively, if we would um, calculate uh, the Z, the Z here is 1.93, and this is why it's being rejected. For the same data, if we are using the synthesis method, uh, Z would be 2.5, so um, non-inferiority is established using the synthesis method, and in this case, actually, all the effect was preserved, and F, the estimate of F is 1.55. So why does the uh, testing using the synthesis in this case works and using the uh, fixed method fail? For that purpose, I'm going back to the equation that I have um, uh, showed you uh, before. This is the easy version of the fixed method, and this is the synthesis method, and actually both uh, are being rejected. We compare both to 1.96. The numerator are the same, but the denominator in this uh, case um, is smaller, so actually uh, the, synthesis, the Z of synthesis will be larger than the, than the easy Z, and the easy Z is even easier to get than the usual fixed method. Uh, and this, is, this actually demonstrates the difficulties that we have with the, um, with the synthesis. So the advan what are the advantages of the fixed? The, the margin interpretation is easier, and it provides a straightforward basis for sample size calculation. However, the margin is too conservative, so the required sample size is large. The synthesis method is more efficient, resulting in higher power. Uh, it allows for the estimation of the fraction of effect preserved. Um, However, it's complicated, very complicated for clinicians for discussions, and there is no direct way to compute the sample size, so there is a need uh, to simulate data, and then more assumptions are needed. Now, if I'm going back to the guidance of the FDA on uh, non-inferiority, then FDA prefers actually the fixed method, but they do acknowledge that the, there is a problem with the large sample size. Um, and then they give some hints to what can be done, and uh, what I'm going to say is my interpretation, and it's not necessarily what they think. Um, so actually, my interpretation is that there are two ways to proceed. Uh, in the first one, uh, to use some kind of hierarchical approach, where in the first stage we are going to use the fixed approach margin uh, to demonstrate non-inferiority, but this is going to be done using the M1 margin, not the M2. In the second stage, provided that the fixed method uh, sorry, provided that the first stage uh, was successful um, to compute the, or to estimate the percent of effect preserved and to test whether it's uh, higher than some pre-specified value, uh, say half. Um, this is, this uh, has an advantage that if we success, uh, there is a success in the first stage but not in the second, but it's not, too far, there is maybe some um, room for discussion with FDA. If, for example, in the first stage uh, we succeed, but in the second one uh, the p-value is, I don't know, 0.7% or something like this and not 5%, uh, this means that we are not very far, so it opens um, for discussion. Another, another possibility is to use uh, what I call a less conservative fixed method. Um, FDA FDA guidance hints that setting the M1 margin at a lower level of confidence, say 90 or 80 percent, is an option at some situation. For example, this might depend on how many historical studies um, you have. Uh, and I will demonstrate it, and with this I will end the talk, and I, so I will demonstrate it, but I just want to say that there is more research needed in comparing the different options because when uh, which option is better is not uh, clear. So if we are going to use the hierarchical approach on the same uh, example that um, uh, I gave before, so in the first stage we are going to apply the fixed margin, uh, but then the margin is um, this value and not half of this as it was before. Uh, here the, non, uh, the lower bound uh, is minus 0 0.005, so actually even this one fails, so we cannot move to the second stage. 
Um, using here uh, on the historical an 80% confidence interval instead of a 95% confidence interval, we get this value, and then uh, the M1 is 0 0.012, M2 is half of this, and then you, using the, the, um, the fixed approach, uh, the lower bound is larger than this bound, and then the actually the non-inferiority is established using this, um, this approach. I will skip this part because I'm, I'm running out of time, right? Um, so I, I'll end by this summary. Uh, so I uh, presented some of the challenges that uh, we are um, experiencing in the development of biosimilar. Uh, some of those challenges are not unique to biosimilar, but they always come up in, um, in biosimilar. Um, there are no, as I said, there are no FDA guidance to shed light on the requirements, but those challenges are being discussed in uh, sessions in, um, devoted to biosimilar in meetings like JSM, the FDA industry workshop, etc. And I would like to thank uh, Patrick, Sivan, and Gaia, all our uh, Tiva colleagues, for uh, many helpful discussion. Thank you.